far, man. How are you? I'm great. I'm I'm glad there are no actual ants. I wasn't sure. <laughs> well, we 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 can guarantee no ants. We can't guarantee no no crazy because it's, it's in the name. Okay, that's true. fair. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's fair. I love it though. I love it, man. Because I'm super excited. Me and all my friends and a lot of people online are. It, it's really the time to be an anime fan. So they're going to be super excited that the one and only one stain. And freaking Ryder Braun is on the show from Attack on Titans, man. It's going to be wild. Uh, we just thank you for your time today, and it's going to be a lot of fun. For sure. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you, you know, we there, we have such appreciation for voice actors, right? Not a lot of people, they, 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 there's this, like, thing. If they don't see you, what do you do, right, kind of a thing. But you guys are just – we've we've been so lucky to have several uh, voice actors on that have voiced these significant characters on all these shows, be it whether it's when I was growing up or now when he was growing up. You know, there's a little bit of an age gap there. If you but, couldn't <laughs> tell. If you couldn't tell. <laughs> but uh, so to, to have that and to see, like, oh, my gosh, my childhood wouldn't even be the same if not for this person, right? It's so cool to talk to you guys and hear about the process and, and, you know, and especially during COVID, right? Let's just jump right in because yeah, voice acting was, was so necessary because animation was about all anybody could do during that little stretch, right? You got Absolutely, the guys. Absolutely, yeah. So, for, a, for a while there, when Sony owned Funimation mm-hmm. before Crunchyroll and all of that happened, um, and they... Funimation was the single producing entity for all of Sony globally for Mm. a couple of months there. Wow. They were the only one putting out any new content. And I have to say, Funimation and now Crunchyroll was great at that time, really stepping up and saying, let's figure it out. Um, They sent out like preloaded iPads and microphones with software. Like a lot of us already had home booth set up, but it right. wasn't set to where the engineer could work with it and you could really, so they figured it out. Someone spent 90 hours writing the, <laughs> the, the list of like, click on this button, then plug this button in and send it all to us and said, we're going to keep you guys working. Wow. And yeah, I mean, it, it really was the the actor's relief fund for, for almost a year, keeping a lot of us, because you know, Truth be told, no one can make a, a full time living as an anime dub actor. Right, like, right. We all have other gigs. It's not. It's not that lucrative. Uh, some for some people, those gigs are going to conventions and meeting with the fans, and that is kind of their full time job. But everybody has five different side hustles, ten different side hustles, and a real job, and we're doing commercial stuff and that sort of thing. Um, and so for a while, all of that just went away, and so. So dubbing anime was kind of the lifeline. And then voiceover and commercial voiceover too. Cause what sure. happened was all the companies that had commercials, like Pizza Hut has, you know, massive commercials right. already in the can that they now cannot show because <laughs> it shows happy families sitting in a restaurant eating the pizza. Right. Like, nope, that's not gonna work. <laughs> so so they all went to like still and they couldn't shoot anything new. Like you couldn't do a commercial video shoot because you couldn't have people on set. You right. Allowed right. So, so it was quick, find some stock footage of pizza and then we're going to revoice it. <laughs> and so voiceover actors suddenly got really busy in that time. And all of us were just in our closets saying, in these unprecedented times, <laughs> in these unprecedented times, we're all in this together. I can't tell you how many times, either on auditions or commercial jobs, that I said the phrase, we're all in this together <laughs> oh, yes. over the course of those 19 months. <laughs> you were feeling like there was 7,500 people in the closet with you. Like, yeah, what is exactly. going on right <laughs> Yes. You know, I love Unlike little... most acting careers, voiceover acting put me back in the car, right? <laughs> I love, though, that you brought up, you know, that you have other gigs, you have other things that you're doing or whatever, because there's this, I think, for whatever reason, this, I don't know, misconception associated with the entertainment industry that anybody works in our industry, we all are rich. We all have money. Right. We're all living the, like, the, the, the good life. And 
The fact is, is that 90% or more of everybody in the entertainment industry, unless you're the Tom Cruises and stuff, we're all going job to job, paycheck to paycheck, trying to scrape it together. So I love when people come on and say, hey, man, I've got a day gig. I've got to do this and do this and do this. Like, because we all do. And, and, you know, the goal is to eventually get maybe Tom Cruise money. But, hey, you know, we get to make the living and do what we're doing. So thank you for the honesty and for the approach of saying, hey, guys, this is how it really is. Well, and before the anime conventions became so prevalent, and those are huge now, and those are kind of a a career path by themselves, right. a separate separate route. But those didn't exist. I mean, I've been doing this since nineteen ninety eight. Whoa, okay. <laughs> um, so, and, and there were not conventions, or if they were, they were in you know a, a, a university commons room with yes. other people in minnesota somewhere <laughs> and uh we're not lucrative and the the sale of autographs and merchandising and the cameo stuff none of that existed and also nobody cared about the dub actor right like, exactly let's be honest, mm-hmm. you talked about growing up on anime but all of us that watched anime in the early days if we were real fans we watched the sub the sub yeah yep. i'm fine with admitting that i'm a dub <laughs> actor i can admit most people who are true fans in the early days only watch the sub. But some things changed. Um, the streaming was a big part of that. Mm-hmm. Because it used to be just DVDs. You know, you'd yeah. go into Best Buy or Fry's or wherever and get the DVD. And the English language track was like a thing that had to be there. Right. Yeah. It was like an add-on that the company distributing it just made and maybe didn't spend any money <laughs> on and didn't put a lot of thought into it. But as the as the industry grew and as streaming grew, suddenly people are watching it on their screen while they're doing their homework, while they're Instagramming, while they're ironing or whatever. You can't read the subtitles while you're doing that. Exactly. So over the last, I would say, six years, the importance of the dub mm-hmm. and the prominence of the dub became a lot more prevalent. And so, you know, Funimation and Crunchyroll and the companies that did that started really working hard to say like, okay, this is an original art form. We can't just think about this as an add on and started bringing in really good writers and really talented directors. And I will tell you the directors are the most important cog in that entire machine in terms of getting a a solid dub out. We can talk more about that process later, but, but people that really cared about it and said, we're going to make this its own thing and a standalone thing. So now there are people that have seen Attack on Titan and that are huge fans that have never watched the, the Japanese. Right. right. That watch My Hero Academia and know me from Stain and have never watched it. And you get a lot of people that come up and be like, hey, I love this show. I love it. I've never heard your voice before. <laughs> Which is fine. I totally get that. Um, but because of the of the nature of streaming content and how people watch it, this, the the – the English dubs have become a lot more prevalent and a lot more important to people. And so the fan base has really grown. And then also the anime conventions are everywhere. Now. Everywhere. There's one in Texas. I have, I don't do a lot of them. I haven't over the past several years, just cause like you said, real jobs and other things. I right. haven't had the chance. I came back to do one of my first ones post COVID and there were 15,000 people there. Oh yeah. my goodness. And I'm like, oh, this world has changed. Right. This is a different thing. And there's a huge hunger for it. People want to come out and want to see and meet these people and also buy and sell and trade. And the vendor boost that went on for like five acres right. in this conference room with artwork and things. Yeah, it was amazing. But that kind of is a a new entry that was not there in, in the 2000s when I was doing this. Oh, I love it though because you brought up so much stuff, and I the multitasking. <laughs> I should stop and let it's you guys. All good. No. It's all good. We, you we are a it. voice guy. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> but like the multitasking is like such a big thing for me specifically because I'll throw on a show and like fold some laundry or you know clean the room up or do all do the dishes like all of these different things. So that is definitely something that is. Uh, Helped me along the way, uh, so I appreciate all you dub actors. Always give you guys your credit. Um, but then there's also like there's kind of a civil war, right, between the dub people and the sub people. Like the sub people will really hardcore look at the people who watch the English version, like in a way like you're not a true fan. Like you just brought up like in the '90s, it is crazy, and I I think it's hilarious. I love the back and forth dialogue about the situation. So that's always so much fun. Um, but I will I would... also say if like if you start 
in one or the other. Right. It doesn't matter how good the other version is. Yeah. It's going to sound wrong to you. <laughs> exactly. No. Uh, oh, that's a great like point. If, if, if I watch the Japanese first and then I watch the American and it's friends of mine, it's people I know that are doing great jobs. Right. I'm like, yeah, no, it doesn't sound right because I identified it originally with it. It's kind of like when you read the book, like you read Game of Thrones or you watched Game of Thrones. Right. And you had a very different view in your mind. So it's kind of, I think where you start. A lot of people will stay there. Oh, for sure. And I mean, it's different too for, because we were talking about sub versus dub, but we're also talking about like the actual television show versus the manga. Like people sure. hardcore, like, okay, it, I mean, it's the same like you just talked about. If you read the book and you watch a TV show, there's little things that you nitpick that you're like, okay, this didn't show up here. Or this didn't show up there. Um, but I do have some fan questions for you. <laughs> I just wanted right, to uh, throw that out there. It is from my friend Jacob, and he, you may oh, not know any of these things, but I just wanted to throw those out there. And um, t I told him I would do this, basically. Um, so it's basically specifically for Attack on Titan. And he says, the ending to Attack on Titan is very controversial. Obviously, you can't spoil anything. All right, hold on. Spoilers <laughs> for anyone that's watching. Let's just say this right now. We're jumping into the ending of Attack on Titan. Right. Yes. yes. Two. Fast forward what? The I mean, oh, to you wave your hands really big when we're done talking about this. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, obviously, it's very controversial, very spoil. Don't spoil anything, but have you read the ending or do you know anything that happens about it? Like, do you know how controversial it is? I have not read it. Mm. And that is specific by design. And it actually happened when I, it's happened on, on several shows, but Mike McFarlane is the director of this uh, the English dub of Attack on Titan. And I think it's, in my mind, one of the, the best ensemble pieces. Like, I think he's done an incredible job from start to finish, and it is a testament to his level of detail and his love for the project. So mm -hmm. I guarantee you, he has read every page. He has right. seen every frame. <laughs> he knows everything. But he was really adamant early on, I don't want you to know until you know. Mm. I don't want you to play things that might be true before the audience is supposed to know that. Right. I don't want. And so when I was cast as Reiner Braun, he said, yeah, he's kind of quiet. He's just a big, gruff dude. He's one of the he's one of the team. Mm -hmm. and, one of the scouts. Uh, yeah. Maybe has a crush on Annie. That's right. all you need to know. <laughs> so when we're but and I was very he was trying to keep me in the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but. I then started getting a whole lot of response. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I can't believe you're Reiner. Rob McCollum is Reiner. This is the thing. I was getting interview requests and I'm like, this dude has like five lines. <laughs> <laughs> Why does anyone care about Reiner? Uh, so I knew something was up, but then when the reveal happens and, and I find out I get to voice, because we actually get to voice the Titans as well. Oh, like, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. As much as it is affected and, and ver verbally altered, uh, it is our voices. So the first time that I got to do that, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> no, wait, that's, I'm, wait, that's, me. what? <laughs> Great. It was a lovely gift. And there are those gifts all along the way. And then I thought like, okay, he's the bad guy. He's mm -hmm. the asshole. Right. He's the villain of the piece. Not knowing that eventually you're going to find out more and then you're going to get a sympathetic side. And then by the end, he is the, you know, Broken, shattered shell right. of a man overwhelmed by his guilt and kind of, in some people's opinion, the emotional core of mm -hmm. the show yep. in some ways. And, and none of that I knew ahead of time, which I think is a huge gift from the director because you can't. You can't play it until you, you know, if you, you don't want to, you don't want to wink. You don't want to ever right. look at it like, I'm actually a bad guy. <laughs> you wouldn't think there's much you can do just vocally one line at a time, but there actually are. It changes the way you approach a character. So Mike is one of the directors that is very solid about that. There have been a, a, a several shows where I ended up being like the closet hero or the closet bad guy. Right. And didn't know. And it was kind of great. I loved I loved those surprises. Um, I think fans are sometimes upset that we like don't voraciously read the manga. Right. But also... <laughs> Things may not show up in the anime that are in the yeah, manga. Yeah, that's true too. And so I don't want to be talking about storylines that the audience that I'm at the con with doesn't know what I'm talking about because that, oh yeah, that's right. That was manga, not in the, in the thing. Exactly. Well, you know, I like that though. I like that <clears throat> approach because, you know, basically it mirrors 
Braun himself because he's basically plucked from childhood and destined to become this warrior and this badass in this epic battle, you know, not knowing that that's the path. And so I love the idea, the approach that you don't know where the guy is headed, what's coming, because that's the reality of this guy's whole life becoming what he becomes is is uh, so th- the whole idea that you along with the character are living this uh, path that that he's yeah. going on that's awesome that's what i was about to say it's Not like you're growing with like them. the audience yeah <laughs> we're, we're we're discovering things when the audience does yeah exactly but also reiner has been a puppet for somebody else's game for his whole life yep. which is just like me in the booth just doing whatever <laughs> <the director's dad. laughs> talk about that relatability that's there. right <laughs> That's so funny. And then the second and final question is the story and mystery is uh, very vital to uh, Attack on Titan. Were you ever spoiled about the big story moments, which I'm guessing not, especially did you know that was going to be uh, did you know what was going to be revealed about your character in season two? Um, I I, again, like I said, I had a little hint that something was coming. Right. And just because of the amount, like when an LA radio show called and wanted an interview <laughs> with me about Reiner, I'm like, I, and I think I'd done one episode at that time. And we don't get them ahead of time. Like we come in and see the scene we're recording and oh, we, wow. don't even, we don't even get to see the rest of the show, right. that episode until, until weeks later when it comes out or when it's online. Uh, although I say weeks now, it's sometimes three days. Yeah, exactly. Like, the turnaround time. <laughs> Yeah, that's another thing that has changed. I'll do a switch, short diversion on that, but that's another thing that's massively changed because it used to be when it was DVD land, you'd come in and do an entire season. You'd do three days yep. and you'd do 20 episodes or how many episodes it was and you'd be done and it wouldn't even come out into the world six months until a year later. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so you did these massive chunks of time and then when what they call simul dub which is that the dub tries to come out within a week mm-hmm. of when the Japanese airs, mm-hmm. um, which in, in is partially just for the fans who are anxious for it and also to help combat pirating and the pirated subtitle versions being out there and that sort of thing. They got really serious of like, okay, we're going to try to stay up. to. So you will come in sometimes as an actor on a show and have two lines and you'll have no idea and sometimes if it's not based on a manga, most of them are, but if it's not based on a manga, the director may not even know. Oh, wow. Like, I don't know if this is just a guy who waltzes through or if he is going to be the big bad by the time we get to see episode six. Right. So, um, which it, it kind of makes it fun and exciting, but you come in for 10 minutes and then you're done and you don't have no idea. So instead of coming in for giant blocks of time, it also made it harder a little while for new voice actors to break in mm. because this is a two line actor. And normally a two line part goes to somebody new that's trying to earn their way and prove their thing. Right. But if the director has to worry that that two line actor might be the five episode arc mm-hmm. coming up later that nobody knows about yet, except Japan. All right, I'm going to call in Rob or I'm going to call in, Aaron Roberts or Ian Sinclair or somebody that I know can handle heavy lifting down the road in right. case, which is why sometimes you'll just see random things like Chris Sabat is man number five screaming help on a platform. Right, right. Because you never know. To be in the studio that day. <laughs> yeah. And also that might be a major character later. I love it. And I have to say, because I'm rewatching the first season right now, and one of my favorite lines from you that first season, and you don't have many, like you were saying, is <laughs> you were chasing after a, a Titan, and you were like, she's got a pretty nice ass for an abnormal. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, they throw these curveballs at you sometimes that you're just not expecting, and it just, it cracks me up so much. And I think that's what's so, like, great about anime because I feel like you know you are able to take chances where you're not able to take chances on some regular television show or movies. So I feel like you know you are able, it's such a dramatic piece, but then you can't throw in that comedy. So well, an attack really took the the chance to say we're going to be a little bit undefinable about what our age. Yeah, range is. exactly. Is this TV fourteen plus? Like we don't know. Like it. Because it, it kept changing and, right. and things were happening. But in the, in the beginning, people were like, oh, there's a bunch of naked babies wandering <laughs> right. around the countryside. Yeah. Like, Can I let my kid watch this? Exactly. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> how old is your kid? Yeah. How cool is your kid? <laughs> I mean, I think so. I think it's okay. But um, 
Yeah, I, I, and that's the other thing with anime, especially for for when we deal with muggles, which is what we call people outside of the world that yes. don't understand what what anime is all about. Like this is not a, a kids medium. This is an everything medium. There are shows for every age group. Just like is Netflix a kids medium? No, it's an everything medium. You can find stuff that they absolutely will love and stuff that they absolutely should not see. Like that's. The same is true of anime. Like, if you want an anime about the detailed inner workings of a Japanese inter- insurance firm, you can find that you in can. a manga. <laughs> yeah. um, or about worlds exploding and, you know, power balls and all that kind of thing. For all sure. of it. I absolutely love it. And as a father of two, um, do either of your children watch anime, specifically ones that you have been in? They very rarely. Yeah. I mean, again, anything <laughs> your parents do is not cool. That's true. That's yep. true. Like, That's you have true. to disregard it. Um, when they were young, uh, Italia and Sergeant Frog yeah. were, were players that they were excited that I was involved in, mainly because their friends were watching it. For sure. Um, but then they, they really had no interest. And it's only when they got to college, especially my daughter, who's in college in Boston, yeah. has... Uh, Fans, you know, friends who are huge anime fans. Nice. And so now suddenly. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> I'll get a call. And she'll be like, hey, do the voice for these people and put me on speakerphone. And never before have, have they been interested. The one thing, the, the thing that they were usually most likely to brag about with their friends was that I was on the voice. Of, I was the voice of one of the Bop It versions. <laughs> oh, okay. The okay. Bop It was yeah. Flick It. Yeah. And that's the thing that they have 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 bragged about for years. <laughs> that's only hilarious. Recently, only recently has anime started to matter in their social circle. Well, I, I'll tell you, you can just see the <laughs> pure enthusiasm and passion and joy on your face when you're talking about it and what you get to do. And, and, and I love that because I, f- I feel like anytime that you're in this industry, you've got to have a passion for it because it can be a pretty rough industry sometimes if you don't have the passion for it and absolutely love what you do. And I want to kind of talk about that a little bit because we've got some stuff going on in the industry right now with the writer's strike. And it sure looks like if you hear the talk and the rumblings in the background, that maybe actors and directors are going to be joining that strike pretty soon when their contracts start to come up in the next month or so. Um, so we've already had some guests on that talk about with the, with the digital world. Now they're basically the, you know, when they step on set, the first thing they do is go into the semi and they're digitally created, you know, with thousands of cameras. And they're told basically that they're doing that so that they can place them wherever they want to, whenever they want to, uh, down the line. And, right. you know, and we've had one of our guests said, um, do we get paid if you place us somewhere like kind of a thing, you know, and everybody was joking on shut up, shut up. But, and we recently we had, um, James Earl Jones, the legend, you know, sign over the rights to his voice, right? For them to be able to recreate his voice from old recordings to move forward with Darth Vader. So I'm curious with the whole AI debate going on right now and the creation of them writing scripts or the digital de-aging and and basically creating people that aren't there in, in these shows. Are you nervous about the industry shift that way to where as a voice actor... They can say, hey, we've got enough of this guy over the years. We can recreate this voice anytime we want to now. Maybe it's time we start allowing the technology to do these voices instead of the real people. Are you nervous about that and towards the push in the industry? Definitely am. I mean, it's it's definitely already within their possibility. Right. I mean, they I I, we talk about side jobs and real jobs. Mm -hmm. One of my other jobs is that I write uh, training about IT security. Oh, wow. And one of the series that we write is called The Inside Man. And it's just for companies. Companies use it to do their training. But it's like a Netflix style series yeah. um, that we shoot in the UK. And we're talking about deep fakes and AI and those kind of things. So I look at these things a lot through that world. And the, the capability is already there. Yeah. I mean, you you need anywhere from five to 20 minutes of of, of a person's voice to be able to do a credible audio deep fake. And there's probably 300 hours of my voice. Right, right. Here's there. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's part of the reason why I don't think the the anime dub actor world would ever be able to truly like unionize and demand the rates that a first 
a first run actor would get uh, uh, to do it because the scripts are there, the voices are there, and they even have the model of the Japanese. You can tell an AI to say, have Rob McGollum's voice say this with the same level of intensity that this Japanese actor said it and make it fit the flaps. Oh, and the AI can figure that out already. So so if I came in and said, I'm going to triple the rates that I demand for my services, <laughs> right. that would be instantly. That would be, uh, yeah, that, that'd be AI Rob real quick. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, I think the real way forward that it's going to go for, for – on-camera actors for voiceover for animation is that it is going to be much harder to get the smaller roles. And if you are the James Earl Jones of the world, or even the Brian Cranston's, there will be this rate if you want Brian Cranston to voice your Ford commercial. There will be this rate if you want the rights to the AI recreation of Brian Cranston. Mm. And he will still get paid. An amount for that, and the unions will fight over that. It's going to take forever to figure that out. We yeah. think that we think the writer strike right now over streaming rights is going to get ugly. When it comes down to determining those rates, it's going to be a weird and ugly battle. But I think that's what it's going to have to come down to. Agreed. Because they can put anyone anywhere in anything right now, and eventually you're going to have an agent for yourself. And then you're going to have an agent for your virtual self mm. and you're going to have an agent for your virtual voice. And those will be put out there just like the licensing firm that licenses like music. Yeah. They want to play an Eminem track in a thing. They have to pay a certain amount. If they want someone else to sing that Eminem track, they pay a different amount. There'll be a scale for whether it is real Rob McCollum or virtual Rob McCollum. Um, uh, and I have no idea. I, and I think, I think for a lot of, a lot of ways it's going to mean that the the top tier is going to continue to make tons of money but mm -hmm. the amount of money that the rest of the world makes is going to get shrunk smaller and smaller and smaller yeah it's a very interesting situation because i mean it, it feels like a lot of things are being pushed towards like the quote unquote freelance gig right or at least that's what they're talking yeah. about with the writers and I, it's terrifying because that's when you come to think about healthcare. That's when you come to think about, you know, like when you pass on, how will all of this continue to go on with your estate and like all of these different things. So that's why, yeah, it's very interesting. And yeah, I, the last strike was a hundred days. I feel like this will at least get to that and maybe even further than that with the streaming. So I don't know. It's well, you just brought up a really good point because most of these unions have like, guidelines and a certain amount of time that you have to put to qualify for the benefits, yeah. right? For your health care and stuff. And if you're right. drastically reducing the amount of time that you're able to work, you're basically telling these people the likelihood of you qualifying to get enough time to get your health care. It's going to be hard. And, and so, yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely, I can mm. see why the unions are fighting because the unions are like, well, well they have to work that why, much. You know, everyone railed against socialized medicine or government funded uh, you know, like like they have in the UK, a national health service where everyone had a minimum level of health care provided for them and said this was all, you know, this is wrong and socialization, all that. But it it changes the argument. It does. In these union things, if like, oh, I have health care, so I can now be a little freer on the kinds of jobs and the kind of contracts I take. But but like Texas is a, is a, is a non-union state, is a right to work state. Mm -hmm. Right. So I am not a union member, but I support um, the union causes because so many of my actor friends and, and projects that I work on are. Um, but the fact that they they made healthcare an employer's problem changes all of these contract Everything. negotiations across, yep. across the, the board. But also that idea that they've gone to the the, the chunk buyout, like we're going to pay you X hundred or X thousand or X tens of thousands of dollars right. for this project. And then you will never make any more. And if this becomes the number one thing on Netflix for 10 years running, you're you're done and you're out. That's what they're trying to do to the writers and some of the producers and directors. And so that's why I knew this was coming. I work a lot in the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're trying, we're wondering if this is going to mean there's all of a sudden a big demand for UK products right. on Netflix. And Amazon because nothing new is coming out of the U.S. right now. Yeah, that's a good it point. Not for a while. Yeah, that that's a very good point. Right, yeah, absolutely. a lot of BBC stuff because I mean we already have that transition into like a lot of BBC stuff is very popular over here. So I mean oh, to yeah. mass quantify it, 
Some that's of my, my favorite own. stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. I see. Oh. That's why I love talking to like-minded individuals because you bring up different aspects that we just haven't thought about before. Um, so that's, that's a great, great thing. Um, I see you are a hockey fan. Yes. What, what, what is your favorite hockey team? I'm always I am a Dallas here. Stars fan. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know when this is going to air, but we are in <laughs> round two of the Stanley Cup. Playoffs yes. Right yes. Now. Yes. Yes. We have a, we have a great team and I've, I have been a Stars fan for a long time. I kind of uh, drifted out of, of watching as much. And then my girlfriend is a huge Stars fan. So she's got me back on the wagon. Nice. I love that. Yeah. Have you ever suited up? Have you ever played or just lifelong fan? Uh, lifelong fan? No, I grew up in Arkansas. There was not <laughs> no, there. not uh, there. <laughs> not a lot of frozen pods. Yeah, not a lot of frozen. Yep, yeah, yeah, no. So, yeah, I knew nothing about hockey until I moved to Dallas nice. back in the 90s, which is when we made our first run to the playoffs with Mike Madonna. Yeah. yeah. Was a huge fan then and got into it. And then and then when they went on strike, again, <laughs> strikes happened and they took a season and a half off. Yeah. And I kind of drifted away and let other things happen. So it's taken a while to come back. But yeah. I'm, a, but that's I'm awesome. a big fan of, of the stars. Um, and just hockey in general. I think it's one of my favorite sports to see live. Yeah. Oh, without like, doubt. Basketball is a fun game to go to, but also it's cool to have the replays and be on TV. Football, I would much rather watch on TV because yeah, agreed. it's pretty slow and you need the commentator keeping the action going. For the Whenever my British friends come over to watch American football, they're like, oh, this is going to be cool. Wait, why did everybody stop? <laughs> we walked around for like two minutes. Oh, okay, we're back. Okay, good. And everybody stopped again. What's yeah, going on? right. Yeah. <laughs> so I would prefer football on television because I need all the distractions and the commercials and the replays. But hockey, to see the ice and see what's happening and see, you know, the line change that didn't happen. So the right. guy that got stuck oh, yeah. another few minutes that you can't see on the TV screen because they're following the puck. Yeah, it's it's great. It's amazing. And and if you're lucky enough to be down, you know, seat level on the on the glass and I mean come on. Don't uh, make uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean but to see a guy get slammed into the glass right in front of you or the puck coming right at you, there's no feeling like that. It's like holy crap, this is amazing. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. And, and just I was lucky enough to play. I played for a little bit and and I was in the net and and Patrick Waugh was my guy. So like, oh, I, sure. yeah, followed before they were the avalanche, you know, just followed him over and, and it's like, but yeah, the game is exhilarating and, and, and to be able to, yeah, huge fan myself. And, uh, it, it's one of the I best was an games. Eddie Bell for man, but that's okay. No, <laughs> hey. yes. So you have to know though, as a fan, one of the, one of the greatest games I've ever seen with two guys in the net was Van Be- Beesbrook with the Panthers and Waugh that's finals where they were just went into like so many overtimes. I literally started watching, watching it i think it was like at 7 30 at night and it didn't end until like 3 30 in the morning I because feel like they, they just changed the overtime rules because of be, that game yeah they, they're they're just like, neither one would give up a TV money <laughs> until three in the morning we gotta end this thing <laughs> they were just insane i mean they're standing on the head just would not give up a goal and it was just incredible man it was incredible then they started changing rules like okay we'll go to Three at four on four, and then three on three, and then goalie <laughs> against goalie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you can't leave the net. You got to shoot from your net and hope the guy gets in. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love that. And I also and wanted there's to. There's icing. So if you miss the goal, you have to do a face off. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh right. my goodness. We have just lost so many anime fans. <laughs> they're like, they're, 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 they're like, wait about a minute. Hockey. He's anime and sports? What? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Well, something else I also wanted to bring up. Uh, we also have a uh, broadcast journalism background. I saw you did as well. Um, so that's that's very interesting. What made you... Uh, what? I, oh. I will say broadcast journalism in quotes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was the host of Good Morning Texas <laughs> in Dallas for a couple of years. Yep. But that is I'll call that journalism adjacent. Uh, okay. Okay. It's <laughs> a lot of like morning show chefs and dance troops and original uh, you know, and then Paid segments where the bariatric surgeon is talking about his stomach <laughs> and, yeah. probiotics. <laughs> You're like, kind of, kind of, sort of. I was oh really just gosh. paid to talk they, to you. They definitely hired an improv comedy guy to do that job as opposed to a real journalist because there was so much needing to act like you were really excited about party playing. Right. <laughs> 
fireproof siding or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's so You're local funny. television, exactly. man. You got to love but, local television. But that's also when when I got to, to meet some of the stars because our studio was right next to where the stars played. And yeah. so we got to meet people and got to meet Mike Madonna once. I got to meet C-3PO. Oh, my oh, goodness. Yeah. That's awesome. Daniels when he came in and Jackie Chan. So – as much of a beating as getting up at four in the morning for Rough. two years was. It, yeah. was, it was cool at times to get to to meet some of those people. Very cool. I love it. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for coming on the show and getting a little crazy with us. It was an absolute pleasure of ours. If you ever want to come back on the show and just shoot the shit or come back on to promote anything, you are more than welcome. Um, awesome. Yes. The only thing I would say is Psychopaths, which is one of my favorite shows that not a ton of people got on board with. Uh-huh. Uh, there is a, there are two new movies coming out. Okay. One streaming and one maybe later even in movie theaters. Mm -hmm. So if you are a Psychopaths fan, I just found out about that and I'm super, super excited that Kogami is coming back. So, oh, hell yeah. That's fantastic. awesome. That's my only plug. It doesn't help me financially at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you know, it's all about social media now. So do you have any handles for anybody to follow? I, sadly, I'm so bad. Other than my Rob McCollum uh, Instagram, I, I have a, a Facebook fan page. Which okay. I think I'm only with seven people left in the world that have. <laughs> but there's a Robert McCollum voiceover uh, Facebook fan page. I love awesome. it. Okay. I love Trying it. to get better about posting things on and doing things too. Where you're going to have two new members. I one of my kids to just do my social media feed. That's the way. Yeah, there, there you go. That's smart, man. That's smart. But listen, thank you so much again. Take care and we'll talk to you soon, man. All right. Nice to talk to you guys. See you later. All right. Bye. See you later. All right. Just another fun freaking show man yeah i absolutely love when they get into a little bit of the personal life and and like the his knowledge about what was going on with ai and the unions and all that because he happens to do it security yeah, work on the side right so you never know where you get that insight yeah. from to know so who knows doing these videos for it security that he's going to get such insight to literally what's going on in his in his union with the with the acting and stuff like that going on right now it's so incredible exactly i absolutely love it thank you again rob for coming on the show